Hello, welcome back to Ethics 2306. We're doing chapter one. I forgot the title. Ethics in the Examined Life. Um, this this is a really easy chapter. It's really short. Pretty much just lays out um, <clears throat> the so-called ethical landscape. So basic, the basic uh, concepts, very basic um, definitions, um, and where ethics fits in the whole enterprise of philosophy. So ethics is a subfield of a larger discipline that's called philosophy. So think about philosophy as being this umbrella term, and you have all these different kinds of <clears throat> of pillars, all these different kinds of uh, subfields. So besides ethics, you also have logic, you have epistemology. Well, logic is the study of right reasoning, correct reasoning. Um, epistemology, uh, if you break it down, is epistemology. So ology, when you hear that word, it's always a study of, right? So bioology is a study of bio, which is life, right? Anthropology, right? Ology, the study of anthropos or anthropoids, which is humans, right? Uh, epistemology, which is a subfield in philosophy, is the study of the epistem, which is Greek for knowledge. Hello. Hello. Yes, Jessica, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hello? Uh, yes, um, um, I'm doing like, like right now the flashcards, but I don't know how, how to do it. I didn't understand about that. I'm sorry, what's up with the flashcards? Uh, I didn't understand how I'm going to do it. Uh, the, the flashcards are, there, are just there to, to for you to study? There's not there's nothing to complete there. Yes. Right. Uh, and the flashcards, um, you might not have access. It depends. Um, this is the first time I try those, those things out. So if if you don't have access, you might have to buy the access code for it. But they're just there to study. Okay. They're not really a big deal. Um, so you don't have access, you can skip them. Uh, you can make your own uh, flashcards. It's just there for your own convenience to study. Okay. But it's not really an assignment at all, right? Just like the, okay. just like the PowerPoint presentations. Yeah. They're just there to help you study. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So continuing with the different fields of philosophy. So we have ethics, which is obviously the study of morality. And then we have um. <clears throat> oh, what did I change here? And then we have um, logic, which is the study of right reasoning, the correct way of reasoning. Um, and then we have epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. And then we have aesthetics, which is the study of art and beauty. So for, the, for this uh, class, we're going to just focus on ethics, although a lot of epistemology and logic and aesthetics will also come into play. So they're not really totally diverse, divorced. Uh, these subfields in philosophy constantly overlap on each other. Uh, for, exist, for instance, my uh, my master thesis was based on uh, aesthetics and ethics and political theory. But anyways, uh, let's go in let's go in into what ethics is, right? Uh, why should we care about ethics? Uh, it answers the main fundamental question that Socrates uh, first brought up. Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And ethics helps us answer what is worth living? What is this examined life? Uh, what is worthy? What is not worthy? What is virtue? What is not virtue? When somebody sent me a message here. Let me see. I can't see it. Um, I think it was about the editions of the books. Uh, any edition would suffice. Uh, the fifth edition would be the, the more uh, useful one. That's the one that I'm going off of. But really, any edition has almost the same information. <clears throat> so ethics, uh, it's necessary because it helps us realize, or not realize, but at least try to figure out what is valuable in life. Um, and not just that, not just what is valuable in life, but also what is valuable within my own internal sense of being. 
uh, <clears throat> and also, um, how can I put this? It's very easy to uh, base your morality, your moral standards, on convention, on tradition, on religion, right? on what your parents taught you, and what your grandparents taught you, etc., and so on. But what ethics teaches us is that this is uh, this easy way out, right? It's not so, it, it leads to an inauthentic life. It leads to a kind of <clears throat> this blind morality that at the, at the end, if you take it to the extreme, could end up as being with no morals. So let me explain this. If you just blindly accept um, what the big book says, right, what the Bible says, without criticizing where those ideals come from, without criticizing your own acceptance of these ideals from the big book, you're just blindly accepting them. Um, and these ideals from the big book are great. They're, they're very useful. Right? The Ten Commandments are very useful. Thou shalt not kill. Right? Thou shalt not what, covet your neighbor's wife. Right? Uh, these are very useful guidelines, but they're pretty general. Right? They're very hard to apply these to specific cases. Uh, thou shalt not kill, for example, the first commandment. Right? Should we kill Hitler? Should we have killed Hitler when we had the chance or not? If we'd have gone with the, with the Ten Commandments, we would have said no, right? We've got to follow the duty to the big book. Thou shalt not kill. But Hitler went off to kill six million people in the Holocaust, right? So if we would have killed them in the beginning, right, we would have been over with that. We could have avoided so many casualties, one over six million. It seems pretty justified to fucking kill Hitler, right? Even though we have this guideline to say thou shalt not kill. Right, so this, these guidelines, right, is the, that we get handed down by tradition. They're very useful, but they, they're limited. And this is where ethics comes, comes into place. It helps us bridge, right, or bridge these limitations from these general guidelines that we get from tradition, culture, religion, and so on and so forth. And how does it bridge? How does it help us fill this gap? Reason. Logic and epistemology, right? How we how do we get knowledge? How do we reason? How do we how do I say that if A if C follows B and B follows A, then A must follow C. Right? Do you guys get that? There's a logical sequence of events there, right? That's logic. That's what ethics gives to moral judgment. There's reasoning behind it. So there's two main things that ethics gives us really. First of all, that things are true. And second of all, that things are logical, that they follow this logical sequence of events when I claim something. Right? Heroin is immoral. Well, why? Oh, because first of all, it's illegal. Uh, and second of all, it's a drug. And third of all, because drugs hurt people and because of the violence. I could go on and on, give you all these premises, all these reasons. That's logic, giving you all this evidence of why I give you a certain claim. Heroin is immoral. So that moral claim has to be backed up by a whole bunch of evidence that are true and related to each other. This is ethics. This is moral philosophy. It's not just saying that uh, gay and lesbian couples are immoral because the book said so, because God said so. It's like, no, we've got to give you much more evidence and premises of why that's the case then. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on uh, with the ethical landscape. Uh, so ethics in itself is divided into a couple of different sub, uh, I guess, sub disciplines or sub approaches. I should say approaches instead. So there's ethics in general. All right, so let me go back. There's philosophy in general, and then there's ethics as part of one of the big uh, main components of philosophy. And then within ethics, it splits into more. Right, so it's like a big little tree going on here. So within ethics, um, there's Three main uh, sub approaches, uh, ways to look at ethics. The first one is what we call, um, in your book, is descriptive ethics. And that, that's okay. I guess I'll, I'll take that because uh, that's what the, the book we're taking. Um, the technical three subfields of ethics are these value theory, 
normative ethics and meta ethics. So I'll say it again. Number one is value theory. Basically, um, what is good in its own right? What is wrong? What is right? What is valuable? Value theory. That's, that's the name of it. The second one, the second one is normative ethics. So this is uh, basically um, what is um, what norms, what guidelines should we accept and follow? Um, so what are the fundamental moral duties? Um, what character traits, such as virtues or vice, should we follow and be moral? What role models should we aspire to be? Stuff like that. That's normative ethics, norms, right? Taking from norms. What is the norm? What is going to be the the normative, right? It's prescriptive. It prescribes something. Uh, number three is meta ethics, and meta ethics it takes a step back. Instead of saying, "Okay, we should be virtuous," it asks, "Well, what is virtuous? What is virtue in the first place?" So you said, "This is good." What do you mean by good? What what is the definition of good? Right. So in the uh, in the first two, value theory, uh, normative ethics, or descriptive ethics, and normative ethics. They already presuppose these definitions of good and virtue as being something already. In meta ethics, they question these presuppositions. They question these definitions themselves. Wait, what is good? Before we even talk about goodness and badness, what is good and what is bad? Let's make that clear. That's meta ethics. Needless to say, it's pretty fucking hard, but really super important uh, discipline for ethics. It's like the it's like the behind the scenes, right? So think about it like a stage here. Let me give you an analogy. Think about it like a theater, right? You're going, you're going to see a theater, you're going to see Shakespeare, one of my favorites, right? In the forefront, you have like the actors and you have um, the dialogue, whatever. But in the background, you have the setting, you have all the props that frames what's going on. Without those props, you really wouldn't know what's really going on. You wouldn't know that you're in a castle with Hamlet looking at his dead father and the ghost or whatever. Or you wouldn't know you were in a battle out there in the fields so of England. Right? You have to have these frames, right? That's what meta ethics does. It kind of frames the playing field of ethics. <clears throat> All right. So I hope this is understandable. I know I'm going kind of quick here. Um, and then the other one um, that's super important for me as well uh, and for the textbook is applied ethics. So we have descriptive ethics and that one descriptive ethics is what the title says. It describes what people do. So this is what sociologists do and anthropologists. They describe the kind of moral codes that people follow in different cultures or in different societies or in different cases. Um, normative, normative ethics prescribes says you should follow this or that. It doesn't just describe, right? So one is empirical and one is prescriptive. <clears throat> Applied ethics is what it says. You apply then these moral codes or these moral guidelines, right? Uh, thou shall not kill. Let's apply that then. See how it works. It works for most cases, but in the case with the Hitler case, right, or Osama bin Laden, right? Was it morally right to kill Osama bin Laden? Even though we have this guideline of thou shall not kill. It was, right? Fuck yeah. Right? It's a good thing we smoked that bastard. Because he's a terrorist, right? He was killing thousands and thousands of people. Think about 9-11 and whatnot. Even though some people might argue 9-11 is an inside job, it's still people died because of his uh, actions, nonetheless. So, you know, was is it, are we justified in killing Osama bin Laden, this terrorist, or should we follow this duty of thou shall not kill? Right. This is what the ethics tries to not give you a straight answer. There's no really objective truth, right? There's no. That's the one thing about ethics. It's not gonna give you a, a straight answer, right? I hate to break it to y'all so early, right? There's no right or wrong, but it's gonna give you the the, the tools, the skills to analyze and examine. Okay, well, maybe this is more right than the other one because it has more premises, it has more evidence. 
as more reason, as more logic behind it, as more truth to it. But it depends. When it's really uh, that's what, this is the beauty about philosophy and ethics, right? It's not like math or algebra uh, where their x has to equal 3.70 so something, right? R. No, it's 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 just life is gray. There's not black and white. There's a lot of gray areas in between, and that's what philosophy and ethics just dives into those gray areas, right? <clears throat> All right, um, so applied ethics is just the application of, of ethical theories to find out if they're good or not. Right? So <clears throat> um, there's a classic example of the trolley problem. I think I put up a, 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 video, a YouTube video of this, which I think is a good show, but that's my own value. <laughs> you can disagree that the good place is a bad show. But anyways, in that show, it shows us the, the trolley problem. Right, you're on the trolley, it has no brakes, all you have is uh, you can change directions and it's splitting in twos. One track splits in two tracks. On the one track there's five workers, on the other track there's your mom. Which way do you go? You have no brakes, you're gonna have to kill somebody or some people. Who's worthy? Who's more worthy? What do you do? Do you go and kill the five workers or you go and kill your mom or your loved one, whoever, right? Your daughter, your son. Right, these I mean these are hypothetical uh, situations. I really hope nobody ever ends up in a situation like that. But these are things that you know might happen. Right, these are things that ethics deals with. These these hard questions. And right? uh, think about abortion. Right? Abortion is a more plausible um, example than the trolley problem. So abortion, right? Should I follow my traditions or should I, you know, abort because I know I'm not, I cannot provide for this kid? And it's going to make my life harder and her life or his life much harder as well. Right? Or should I just keep it and I've committed a sin and I need to keep it? Right? Ethics help us you know, examine these tough ethical issues. Right? Capital punishment. Is capital punishment okay? Should we kill people because they kill? Right? Or does it just perpetuate killing and more? Desynthesize people because we're just killing more people. Right? Do we fight fire with fire, right? Basically, or not? Right. This is what ethics helps us not find the right answer or wrong. Just helps us get better at reasoning for one side or the other. Okay. So yeah. So we're talking about some crazy ethical issues. If you haven't seen the the discussion boards, um, pretty crazy stuff in this book. But these stuff are really real life ethical issues, dilemmas. Um, ethics is all about life choices. What choice should I make? Every action you make affects somebody else, right? We live in a vacuum. We do, we are in quarantine, but we're still social beings, right? We're, we could kill another by just simply breathing on them. That's fucking crazy, right? I never thought that we would be here. And that's where ethics comes in. Should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Should I stay home? Or should I exercise my freedom, even though I know that I might be spreading, or I might be contagious, or I might uh, get that myself, right? This is some ethical issues we're dealing with right now, right? And hopefully these these skills and these moral theories that we talk about throughout the rest of the semester might help you, you know, critically analyze what is your best choice. You know, there's no right or wrong choice. It's just maybe the best one according to logic and reason <clears throat> and truth content. All right. Uh, all right, that was a long spiel. Uh, anyways, uh, in ethics, we've got to also make, sh make sure the distinction is clear between values, right, so value theory, and obligations or duties. So, uh, for example, um, I, like, um, I like sushi a lot, right? It's, that's valuable to me. But maybe not to somebody else, right? But am I obliged? Am I obligated to buy sushi all the time because I find it so valuable? No, right? There's two different things there, right? So something might be good, but might not be an obligation. Right? So make sure to get those distinctions kind of separate there, right? Between values and distinctions. Uh, Jessica, yeah.
So it's a big difference between blaming somebody as good or wrong, or you know, uh, doing your duty, you know, providing food for the homeless or whatever you find your duty as, right? So values and obligations, a good distinction to keep in mind. Um, another good distinction to keep in mind is the distinction between instrumental and instrumental and intrinsic value. Sorry, instrumental and intrinsic value. So instrumental, instrumental is just a means. Uh, gas, for example, gasoline is so cheap right now, right? And it's valuable for us, right? Especially if you have an internal combustion engine, which most of us do, right? Um, you, um, gas is valuable, but it's not intrinsic valuable. It's not, it doesn't have value, value in itself. It has value as a means, as transportation, right? It's a fuel, right? If you have gas in itself, it's invaluable, it doesn't itself. It's actually kind of dangerous just to have gas in itself, right? Um, so what's important here is this distinction here about instrumental value, right? A tool, a hammer, right? It's an instrument. It's valuable as long as I'm able to build a house or build a shed or whatever I'm going to build. Whereas intrinsic value, that's something that's good or valuable in itself, intrinsically good. Happiness. Happiness is just good in itself, right? It's like an end in itself. It's an end in itself. Um, joy, happiness, honor. Uh, I don't know. What else can I think about? Intrinsic value. Pleasure, virtue, beauty. Right? Beauty. Right? It's just good in itself. Right? It doesn't get you somewhere else. Or I guess maybe in this artificial world today. But a beautiful painting, right? It's, it's beautiful because it's, right, it's just... In its own thing, right? It's its own category. So the big difference between instrumental value and intrinsic value, right? So a person right, has intrinsic value for being a person, whether you're human, as compared to like a car, <laughs> right? If you're always like in the bridge and the bridge collapsing, I would save the person because it's more valuable than the car. Right? That's the difference between instrumental value, the car is just instrument, and the human being is intrinsic, it's valuable in its own right. All right, so, <clears throat> so what else should we talk about here? So some, some key, I guess, criteria to keep in mind when we're talking about ethics and ethical theories. So these are some like rules or some guidelines we should follow or some goals we should set ourselves for when we talk about ethical theories. And when I talk about ethical theories, it's just no more, no more or less than this. It's just a general guideline or a viewpoint of how I see the world and how I'm gonna act according to that viewpoint. All right, so one of the first, I guess, um, elements of ethics, as the textbook calls them, is the preeminence of reason. So again, logic, reason, is the number one go. Right? Things gotta be reasonable. You just can't pull things out of your ass, basically. And it gives us evidence. You gotta gives us uh, premises. It's gonna be logical. It's gonna be it's gonna be reason behind this stuff. This is critical reasoning. Okay. Um, so a logical argument, right? It's not just bickering, not just hollering at each other. There is some. It's a set of statements that support each other to come up with a conclusion. And that's an argument in philosophy and ethics. And that's what we'll be using, hopefully, throughout the discussion boards. If you give me a conclusion, I believe this is wrong because so, so, and so. Bam. And that's an argument. The so, so, and so, those are the premises. Your main conclusion, your main claim, that's your conclusion. Right? That's your claim. Uh, God exists. It's a big claim. Because, bam, so, 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 and so. Because it's got to be a first mover. Because... Um, People are inherently good, and God is all good, or you know whatever. You just give me all these kinds of evidence, right? Of whatever you believe in, right? So uh, logical argumentation—that's mainly the main thing we're gonna be dealing with. That's like the, our tool, our, our skill set, right? That's our, our hammer that we're gonna build our ethical house with—is this logical argumentation. 
<clears throat> All right. Um, the next, uh, I guess, criteria or goal is the universal perspective, the principle of universability. Um, this means that uh, a moral statement uh, must apply, or a moral, th a moral theory, a principle, a guideline should apply in all places universally, equally. Right? Uh, thou shall not kill should be applied to everybody equally across the whole universe. Right? There shouldn't be exceptions to that. That's a goal. Not all theories will reach that goal, as we'll find out later in the semester. But it's a goal of ethics to have this, this universal perspective. Right, that, uh, that one situation must apply in all other situations. Um, if anybody wants to just like jump in and ask me a question, just cut me off, that's fine. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm kind of talking too fast, but that's my nature. All right, the next principle is a principle of impartiality. So what is impartiality? It's being not partial. So when, you, when you're partial, you're partial to something. You're part of something, right? You're a partially part of something. That's what kind of like the etym etymology of this word is, right? You're becoming part of something, right? When you're partial, you either choose one side or the other. You become part of one side or part of the other side. When you're impartial, is the opposite. You're impartial. You're going to look at both sides equally and weigh them out. That's the principle of impartiality. When applied to ethics, to the moralistic point of view, to moral philosophy, this principle of impartiality just means that all persons are considered equal. And thus, as equal, they should be treated equally. Right? So all persons are considered equal and should be treated accordingly as equals. So the welfare and the interest of each individual should be given the same weight as all other individuals. For example, um, if, if Mr. X and Mr. Y commit the same crime, and Mr. X gets uh, probation and Mr. Y gets the death sentence, and the only difference between those two people is that he has money and this guy doesn't, that's being partial. That's not impartial. That's being, you know, favorite to the ones with wealth. Impartiality means that you have no favorites. You're just neutral. Okay, and that's what a good ethical theory thrives for, right? Not just impartiality, but the other two we just talked about. Reason is logical. Uh, it tries to apply it universally, and it's impartial. And the last kind of goal, or last criteria for these ethical, for a good ethical theory, is the dominance of moral norms. So what the fuck is this, right? <laughs> uh, the dominance of moral norms is basically um, Moral guides, moral principles have are better or have higher value than non-moral claims. So, for example, um, Hitler is a bad man has more moral value or moral worth as a claim than that rocket is bad. Right? The rocket in itself, you know, it's just a rocket. Right? It's just you can't really make a moral claim about that, or that's a bad car, or that's a bad man, right? Those difference in values, right? So moral claims have more value than non-moral claims. This is basically what this is saying, okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, the last part of this uh, chapter talks about really uh, the relationship between ethics and religion. And I'm not really going to go much into it. I think I already talked about this throughout this little lecture here. Uh, but basically is that they overlap. There's no question about that. There's a lot of overlap between ethics and religion because religion does take into account how we should live. And that's what ethics is all about. The main distinction, though, that we should keep in mind is that ethics doesn't presuppose the existence of God or doesn't presuppose that God is the almighty, all everything uh, N-word, and questions, actually, the existence of God. 
It examines if that's possible or not. It examines if those guidelines of the Ten Commandments are actually good or not. Right? So it's, it's critical by nature. Right? And that's why I said in my first lecture of the introduction, is this class is that. By nature, you have to have an open mind. Um, um, if you're highly religious or not, it shouldn't really matter. Right? Because you need to accept and embrace the opposing viewpoints. Okay? <clears throat> so religion and morality. Um, many people say that, like, oh, I don't need morality, I don't need ethics, because I know what's right and wrong based on my religion. That's a problematic claim. Uh, namely because you are doing ethics <laughs> if you are just sticking with, with, with religion. Re religion themselves, uh, theists, right, uh, theologians, right, these priests that just study religion and try to make sense of it, uh, people who live in the Vatican, for example, in the Vatican archives, uh, they use reason, they use logic. Right? Think about Thomas Aquinas, think about uh, St. Augustine, right? think about all these famous theologians that try to justify why we should believe in God and why the Bible is the right way to live using reasons, premises, because of this, so, and that, and because of this. Right? So believers need reason as well, as non-believers do. Okay? Um, when there's conflicts between believers and non-believers, or when, between believers themselves, right, ethics could help as a bridge because of reason, because of logic. And logic itself is just a tool. It's, it's kind of neutral. Right? It just kind of helps examine arguments. The tool itself is not partial. It's just a tool. Logic itself is just a tool, like math. Logic and math is almost the same thing. Except for the difference is that in logic, you have words, actual words, instead of just X's and Y's and stuff. <clears throat> so when conflicts arise, ethics could help us bridge the gap here. Uh, and then another uh, reason why we should care about ethics uh, is that it enables productive discourse. Because there's conflicts between people, because individuals don't always agree, and that's a good thing, right? It's ethics, this, 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 this backbone of logic, reason, and truth helps us reach a middle ground. Right? It's a bridge, again, between conflicting viewpoints, right? Um, and just to uh, throw it out here, if you're, you're the one, like Thomas Aquinas, that believes that what is right is what God is, says is right, this is what Euthyphro believed in the ancient Greek. Uh, is what the God says is what's right. This is called the divine command theory, and we'll talk about that ethical theory. Right? This is a, it's a legitimate theory of its own. Many philosophers still abide to that theory and and develop that theory. Right? I'm not bashing religion here at all. I'm just saying there's different viewpoints to take into account as well. Okay. So the divine command theory just says that, that the divine, whatever the divine commands, that's the right thing to do. Okay, And that's an ethical theory of its own. We call it a non-consequentialist theory. It's not about the consequences. It's all about what God says is right. And I strongly recommend that you read um, Plato, the Euthyphro. It's the, it's the last part of the chapter here, chapter one. It's a really short um, dialogue or a Socratic dialogue. An elenchus, as we call it in Greek. This elenchus is basically just trying to figure out um, that. It, it's, a, it's an examination. It's a critical examination of the divine command theory. So basically the synopsis is this. You have your thrifro, who is uh, the best priest, the smartest, uh, most pious priest in Athens, ancient Greece. And then you have Socrates, who is on his way to trial. <laughs> he's on the way to his trial where he's going to be killed. Uh, but he's not on the way to trial, to, to, to the court to be tried, and he stumbles to con Euthyphro, and he's on his way to trial as, as well, Euthyphro, and whatever, you, know, and that's an, you, you need to know the context. The basic question is that Socrates is trying to find out what does it mean to be pious? What does it mean, in other words, what does it mean to be faithful? What does faith entail? And he goes through a thrift row because he's he's like the head priest of Athens. So he needs to know, right? He's all about religion. So he needs to know what faith is. Turns out that your thrift row doesn't. 
Okay, long story short, I need to break it to you. But read the story. It's really fascinating. It's really, it's really cool. Um, and this back and forth dialogue, this Elenkus, this Socratic method, that's what, what it is, the Socratic dialogue, is essential for ethics. This is another tool besides logic, right, reason, and truth to get to a better uh, understanding of life, the Socratic method. And we'll talk about, further about the Socratic method on chapter, I think, three. But um, this is it. This is the end of chapter one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And you guys have a good day and be safe. And keep up with the readings, the discussion boards, and the quizzes. All right. See you all tomorrow.